My hope would be that the synodal process makes us better evangelizers and that we're clearer and stronger, have a better um, cohesiveness as we go about this work. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the senior publishing director at Word on Fire. Lots of people are talking about synodality. Synodality. What is it? What does it mean? What does it not mean? That's what we'll be discussing today with Bishop Barron, who joins us from Rochester, Minnesota. Bishop Barron, good to see you. Brandon, always a joy to see you too. Now, at the time of recording here, we're recording this in November, you just returned from the Good News Conference, the second annual Good News yeah. Conference held in Phoenix, Arizona. Tell everyone how that went. That was great. I loved it. We had about, I don't know, 1,100 people. They, they more than sold out. And um, came for like three days of, of, of talks and liturgy and uplift and book signings. And uh, Father Michael Schmitz was there and Jonathan Ruby was there and lots of other uh, speakers. I gave a keynote address, and then we had uh, I did a liturgy one of the nights. So I, I loved it. Second year, as you say, the first one was out your way in Orlando, and this was in Phoenix, and uh, people seemed to you know, have a good time, and yeah, it was good for Catholics to get together and, and kind of lift each other up and uh, support each other. So uh, it, was a, it was a marvelous weekend. One of the other very interesting people you got to meet was Gianna Emanuela Mola, oh, who's the daughter of St. Gianna. Tell us how that went. Yeah, I had heard about her for years and seen photos of her and read things, but uh, she looks startlingly like her mother. That's what when you first meet her, just based on photographs. And we did one of the windows, the John Paul II Chapel is of Gianna Bredamola, and it's one of my favorites. And, uh, you know, she's an extraordinary saint of the 20th century and a great hero of John Paul II. So to be with her daughter, and, you know, I, I just met her for the first time, but those that know her say she's a lot like her mother in terms of her saintliness. So it was just a privilege to be with her. And uh, she speaks, uh, I mean, very good English with an Italian accent, but it's very uh, clear and good English. So we had a chance to visit a little bit. Yeah. Well, a big thank you to our friends at Corporate Travel who arranged the Good yeah. News Conference, partnered with us on it. Um, they've already announced the 2023 Good News Conference is yeah. coming back to my city here in Orlando. It'll be held yeah. in November 2023. Bishop Barron will be there. I think they've also announced a, a few of the other speakers, um, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, Father Dave Pavonka, yeah. and then uh, Tim Tebow, the the Heisman Award-winning oh, uh, football that. player okay, from good. the University of Florida. He'll be there speaking as well. So if if that I sounds interesting, that. Glad to hear I that. encourage people yeah. to go to goodnewsconference.com. You can register for the 2023 Good News Conference. Okay, well, let's turn, Bishop, to this topic of synodality. Again, it's on a lot mm -hmm. of Catholics' minds because Pope Francis has initiated this years-long process of listening and dialogue centered around synodality. It, it opened with a service in Rome on October 9th, 2021. It was supposed to last two years through 2023, but then he recently extended it another year through 2024. Um, lots of commentary on this. Some people are celebrating this development, saying we need more of this listening and dialogue and synodality. Others more cynically are equating this focus on synodality as having a meeting about meetings. Um, a lot of the commentary centered around this upcoming synod on synodality. Uh, I, I wanted to talk with you about it only because it, it still seems very ambiguous to a lot of people, but specifically because you gave a long talk on the topic of synodality to the Canon Law Society of America. Uh, first, maybe tell us about that talk. How did you end up speaking on this topic to that group? Well, they invited me, and I'm not a canon lawyer. I'm not trained in canon law, but they invited me. It might even have been before COVID. I think it was delayed at least a year because of COVID. But they asked me to talk about synodality. And I think they wanted me to talk not so much from a, a technically canonical standpoint, but from a theological standpoint. So that's what I did. I, I brought in three theological uh, figures, each of whom I think are helpful to engage the issue of synodality. So that's, that's what I did as the keynote address. Now, usually when we have these discussions, we like to start with a definition. Um, so I thought we'd start with the definition of synodality, but in, in some, from some perspectives, this is the great difficulty that it's hard to define synodality. And that's what this whole discussion 
this four year long, three year long discussion is meant to be about. But let's try to start there. Um, how would you define synodality and what is it? Well, I would follow the Pope's prompts here. I mean, he's the one that's really gotten us thinking about this in a focused way. And the word itself, as everyone points out, is from the Greek that means walking together. So we're together on the road. So take that as sort of a master metaphor that the church, though it has a hierarchical structure indeed, but the church, as John Paul II reminded us, is a communio and it's a set of, of relationships Vatican II insists on the image of the people of God journeying together toward eternal life. So as I read the Pope on this, it's a church that as part of its inner life and structure uh, listens to one another. Uh, it's not a denial of the church's authority structure or its hierarchical nature that, that bishops have this, you know, centrally important role of governance, and they govern always in union with the Pope. And I mean, no one's questioning that, but they're looking more broadly at the life of the whole church and saying, we are in this together and that we should uh, listen to each other, confident that the Holy Spirit is present in the church. And so we can together discern the movement of the Spirit. Uh, one way the Pope I know has, has uh, I think, helpfully characterized it is, it's not just listening to each other. It's it's listening for the Holy Spirit, listening together for the voice of the Holy Spirit, and then discerning so that we can hear that voice more clearly. And he wants this, this sort of mutual listening to the Spirit to happen at all levels of the church's life. The Pope, indeed, listening to the, the bishops, the bishops to each other, the bishops to their people, the people listening to one another, that he wants this to be a, a structuring element of the church's life. That's how I understand Pope Francis on it. A lot of people associate synodality with Pope Francis. It's been one of the themes he's championed throughout his papacy, but this doesn't originate with him, does it? That previous popes no. have, have talked about and encouraged synods, for example. Well, indeed, you know, more recent, more recent years, go back to St. Pope Paul VI, who in the wake of Vatican II, which, by the way, is a synod. When Vatican II refers to itself in its documents, it calls itself a, this great synod, this, this universal synod. So Vatican II is a, is a prime example of it. Uh, but in the wake of Vatican II, Paul VI kind of reinstituted in, in its modern form the uh, ongoing synod of, of bishops so that every, usually three years or so, there's, a, there's an ordinary synod where, where the bishops are called together to speak about, listen to each other, talk about some topic. So over the years, priesthood, the laity, uh, vocations, um, the one that I attended in 2018 on, on young people. Um, so on a regular basis from the time of Paul VI, the church has been gathering um, synodally, if you will, to um, discern these great issues. But then, heck, go back before Vatican II, all the ecumenical councils, going back to the Council of Jerusalem in the first century, were synods. Then there's all kinds of local synods. You go up and down the church's centuries, it, it, at the national level or regional level, there have been synods, gatherings of, of bishops. So no, it's, it's been part of the church's life, you know, from, as I say, the synod of Jerusalem. When, when you know, Peter and Paul and, and the others get together and say, now what, what do we do and how do we handle this problem? So no, there's nothing really particularly new it's a kind of revival of um, of this idea, but in light of, I think, Vatican II and Paul VI. You mentioned just a moment ago that you have had a personal experience being part of a synod. Yeah. In 2018, Pope Francis convened a synod on the, the uh, topics of young people, the faith, and vocational discernment. If I remember correctly, yeah. you were in Rome for just over 30 days. Is that right? It was a, it was a long time yeah. there. Um, what was your experience of synodality like from the inside? Yeah, you know, it was it was good, Brandon. It was um, as and you were weren't you there for part of it? I think you came over, didn't you, for a, a little bit of that? Because a lot of word on fire people kind of cycled through, as I remember. It was a lot of work. I remember that. <laughs> it was indeed a lot of listening. A lot of the synod was you're in the that synod room, which is a bit claustrophobic, especially when it's full of <laughs> full of bishops and cassocks. Uh, but we each had the right to give a four minute intervention. So if you got about, there probably were around 200 of us, I guess. 
So 200 people, uh, each speaking for four minutes, that, you know, takes some time in a variety of languages. And then we broke into language groups and then continued this process. So we would go over what they call the instrumentum laboris, the working document, and then we would listen to each other as we'd say, well, I think this doesn't make sense or that could be said better, and we'd go back and forth. And then those groups would report. That was my job. I was the relatory of our group, which meant I had to take the notes and prepare something and then report to the general synod. So then they would listen. Okay, what did your group come up with? So it really was a whole month of listening to each other, talking to each other about these issues and trying to come to some real conclusion. So the final document that we voted on was our attempt to say, here's what we've kind of achieved during this month. Under the headship of the Pope, but I'll say this to his credit, the Pope hardly ever spoke during the Synod. He was there, but he wanted us to speak. And I think he knew, heck, if the Pope speaks suddenly, all right, I guess that resolves that issue. You know, We'd stop speaking to each other. So he was there. So we were clearly with him. And you know, they say cum petro et sub petro, with Peter and under his headship. We were there, but he wasn't um, contributing much until the very end. So that, that was my experience of it, and it was, um, you know, it was good. It was good. Uh, I thought it was, it was a healthy exercise for us. Not that you agree with everyone that's speaking. You don't. I, I often strenuously disagree with people. Um, we had a couple of, of, you know, floor fights, which is okay. That goes on in any sort of um, assembly of human beings. But I, I, to me, it was, a, it was a positive experience. In your talk on synodality to the Canon Law Society, you used three figures, namely John Henry Newman, Bernard Lonergan, and Augusto del Noche, not so much yeah. to criticize the notion of synodality, but to make some distinctions right. that serve to clarify the concept and especially to hold off potential misunderstandings or dangers. Right. So I thought we could yeah. talk through each of those figures and the Good. light that they shed on synodality. So the first one was John Henry Newman, and you say that in some ways Newman anticipated this very idea of synodality. For example, he has a famous essay about consulting the laity in matters of doctrine, which in his day caused him no shortage of trouble. Um, <laughs> right. He encouraged the church to listen to the laity, among other groups, but to consult them in the process of determining doctrine. Now. Of course, as you observe, a lot hinges on that word consult. What does it mean to consult right. the laity on matters of doctrine? So what did Newman mean by this? And what lessons does Newman offer for synodality? He makes a key distinction. Uh, he says, think of the way a doctor would consult your pulse to determine your health. So the doctor is, is, um, is seeking information about the health of your body. And then compare that to the way the patient consults the doctor to find out what he, what he ought to do and what pills he ought to take and so on. He said the later consulted in the first sense, not the second sense. And what he means is this. The teaching church indeed consults the laity's point of view, their attitudes, their ideas, to get a feel for where the body of Christ is, to, to check the temperature, if you want, of the body of Christ. It's not saying oh, the laity are saying we should have married priests, therefore let's have married priests. That would be a sort of parliamentary democracy, that we're, we're consulting the people to find out you know, what, what the law of the nation ought to be. See, that would be con consultation in that second sense of we're like, uh, yeah, the patient's going to consult his doctor to find out what to do. So the church is not consulting the laity in that sense, but in the first sense to kind of get, get a feel for, to check the temperature of, to, it's one of the elements, Newman says, that the church looks at when trying to determine the, 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 um, the health and the, and the liveliness of the body of Christ. And I think that's a very helpful way to, to get at it. So look at what we're doing now in the church as we're consulting the laity indeed. And we're hearing from all kinds of people when I was still in California, I, I was in charge of the process in our pastoral region. So we had a number of these synodal gatherings, and we heard from people, and we had to assemble their viewpoints and send them on to the USCCB. Okay, does that mean, oh, I guess the people of America are all saying, you know, we should approve of gay marriage? No, no. 
we're, we're listening to the people of God. And indeed, some people are saying, hey, we should have, you know, gay marriage and, and we should have uh, women priests and we should allow artificial contraception. And sure, th those points of view are, are surfacing. And we're consulting that to find out, oh, where are the people of God? But it doesn't mean we're now making a parliamentary decision. Oh, we've polled the people and 71% say, you know, let's have gay marriage. So therefore, let's have gay marriage. So I'm using Newman, or I use Newman in the talk to say that's not what consulting the laity is about. It's consulting in that first sense of the term. Let's look at the second figure you held up, namely the Jesuit theologian Bernard Lonergan. He laid out a fourfold process of knowing reality. Yeah. We've talked about it several times here in the podcast. And the four steps are be attentive, be intelligent, be reasonable, and be responsible. Why are all four of those steps important, and how do they relate to synodality? Yeah, um, the first step in coming to know anything. You're a scientist, you're a philosopher, you're, you're trying to understand another human being, right? Whatever, whatever type of knowledge you're seeking, the first step is open your eyes and your ears and take in what is really there. See, what's the case, you know? Study the phenomenon in question. Think of a, a very careful scientist who spends hours and hours looking through a telescope or a microscope and, and assembling the data as they really are. Not just seeing what he wants to see or seeing you know, what his very limited research gave him, but a very thorough, exhaustive study. Or think of someone who's trying to understand another human being. Maybe you're a, you're a psychotherapist. And your job is to really see and hear, right, what's going on, who this person is. That's step one, be attentive. Step two, being intelligent for Lonergan means having an intuition in regard to form. That means what's the intelligible pattern that explains the data best, right? So I've taken in the northern lights, Look, look at that. I, I've, I've looked at that phenomenon, but now I've got to figure out, well, what is that? What causes that? What's the intelligible structure of the aurora borealis? And now I come up with hypothesis A and B and C and D, and I've got this idea and that idea, and, and I entertain all these possibilities. Same with, you know, a psychologist who's trying to understand somebody. Well, boy, it could be because, you know, his childhood or maybe his parents did this or maybe this is what he's about or maybe that's what's motivating him. And he, and he entertains a wide variety of, of possibilities. But, but you can't stay at that level, Lonergan says. You got to move to the third level, which is the level of judgment. Now you have to say, okay, having looked at all these bright ideas, which one is the right idea? And now you think of a scientist who's uh, experimenting. So he's got a lot of bright ideas, but now he's going to experiment to see now which one of these is really right. Or the good psychologist that says, okay, I've, I've considered hypothesis A, B, C, and D, but I, I think now B, that's the right hypothesis. That's the level of judgment. And then finally, Lonergan says, be responsible, which means once you've made your judgment, okay, act in accord with it. Have the courage of your convictions. Follow through on what you've decided. Okay, so that's Lonergan. How does it apply to synodality? I think very uh, effectively. Steps one and two, exceptionally important. As the church is seeking to understand itself and the Holy Spirit. Well, step one, be attentive. What, what's going on in the life of the church? Open your eyes, you know. And maybe there are things you don't want to hear or don't want to see, but no, no, you got to overcome that. You, you've got to pay attention. So think of all these listening sessions. Um, let's say you're in the room and you're thinking, come on, that's for the birds. Are you, you can't say that. All right, all right, be patient. All we're doing now is we're opening our eyes and ears and we're, we're being attentive, right? Second level, be intelligent. Okay, so what's what is the best way forward? What what is the Holy Spirit telling us? What, what what's the next? What's the right path to take? Well, I got this proposal, that proposal. Liberal, conservative, moderate, different ideas. Okay, okay, fair enough. That it's it's okay to be kind of creative and and expansive in your thinking at that stage. 
But then stage three is, uh, is the stage of judgment. You have to make a judgment. You have to say, of all these possibilities, all these bright ideas, there's a right idea. And see here, go back to Newman for a second. Newman would say here is where the teaching church, the Ecclesia Docens, the church that, that teaches, does its work, is finally a decision has to be made. No, no, we, we can't go that route. No, 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 uh, uh, gay marriage would, would just be opposed to the very essence of marriage. We can't go that way. And so the church, I would say in its formal hierarchical structure, has to make that determination. Um, now, what I said to the folks at the Canon Law Society was, I think sometimes when people talk about synodality, they can get stuck at levels one and two. They can say, hey, it's all about, you know, listening and taking in and entertaining a wide variety of ideas. And I would say, yeah, yeah, it is about that. But then a further step has got to be taken. And we can't get stuck at level two of the epistemic process. Sorry for that kind of long-winded answer, but that's that's what I argued in regard to Lonergan. Let's look at the third figure now, Augusta del Noce, um, this 20th century Italian philosopher, political theorist, drew a distinction between authority and mere power. How does this distinction yeah. help us to rightly understand synodality? He's a great figure, del Noce, not well known in the English-speaking world, but getting a little bit better known. Um, you know, real authority, and he relates it to the uh, Latin augere, which means to like increase or to to you know grow, augment would come from that. Um, real authority, he thinks, is rooted in a keen sense of objective value, and those objective values are finally related to the supreme value of God. So authority has a link to a transcendent set of, of values. And so whatever power it exercises is in service of this kind of moral and spiritual purpose, right? Now, his argument is when we lose that connection, which he thinks happened with modernity, when the connection to God, and then eventually people like Nietzsche and so on, the connection to objective moral value is lost, what you're left with is a kind of pure or raw power. Now, again, Nietzsche comes to mind here, you know, if... if uh, we're beyond good and evil, and God is dead, right? We've lost our connection to those things. What's left is the play of power within human societies. What's left is this um, pure kind of jockeying for position and, and uh, influence within a, a human society. In his language, when metaphysics is lost, what we're left with is a kind of sociology, and power is understood as dynamics that, that, are, that are played out within this sociological framework. Now, here's where I would apply it to the synodality discussion, is I think a lot of people on the left will tend to read the synodal process in more sociological terms and not in metaphysical terms. What I mean here is the questions of power, who has it, who's been excluded from it, uh, who needs to be heard, who, um, who's up, who's down, become paramount. Rather than what's, what's really the great ethical, moral, and spiritual good for this community? That's real authority, which is connected to metaphysics, as opposed to mere sociological power. And the fear is that some advocates of synodality, I'm not saying this is what Pope Francis means by any, any means, but some of the advocates, I would say, fall a prey to this sociologism, you know, the, the loss of a metaphysical vision, which leads then to a kind of Michel Foucault approach to life, where it's, it's really a question of power and who has it. Um, so that's where I use Del Noche to hold off that danger of sociologism. Let's close with this question. As a bishop, what are your hopes for this three-year process of synodality? In your mind, what would a successful synod look like? That we're more committed to Christ and to his mission. That the church has got a clearer sense of 
our mission and that we're together in our, um, our pursuit of that great goal. My hope would be, and here I'm, I'm with Pope Francis, go right back to Vatican II, Paul VI, Evangelii Nunciandi, come right up through John Paul II and Benedict, the new evangelization, come right to Francis, Evangelii Gaudium, which I heard uh, with my own ears from his mouth is the key to his papacy. To me, there's a golden thread that runs right from Vatican II to Evangelii Gaudium. So my hope would be that the synodal process makes us better evangelizers and that we're clearer and stronger, have a better um, cohesiveness as we go about this work. That'd be my hope for it. Well, it's time now for our question from one of our listeners. Every episode, we take one question. If you have one for Bishop Barron, please send it in to us at the website askbishopbarron.com. Today, we hear from Elijah, who is a soon to be a new Catholic. He's going through the RCIA process right now, and he has a question for Bishop Barron. Here's his question. Hello, I'm Elijah from Springfield, Missouri, and I'm enrolled in RCIA. Uh, recently, we covered adoration, and we went uh, as a class. I'm in love with adoration. My question is, what is appropriate to bring into adoration? Um, could I bring a Bible, you know, prints from the Liturgy of the Hours? What What is allowed and what isn't allowed in order to bring reverence to our Lord and Savior? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question, and really glad that you're enjoying adoration. There's a lot of Younger people, I think, have, have discovered the power of it. I might have quoted this before, Brandon, on our, our podcast. Uh, Fulton Sheen, you know, was asked about the Holy Hour, and he said, you know, basically do whatever you want, that the main thing is taking the time. There he's like Merton, you know, the, the best thing you can do for your prayer life is take the time. So the main thing is that you spend an uninterrupted hour in front of the blood sacrament. Now, what you do with that hour, a lot of different ways to look at it. I like those that suggest maybe spend part of the time in sheer wordless adoration. You know, I look at him, he looks at me, and I'm, I'm just, I'm in the presence of the Lord. Maybe spend another 15 minutes, everyone that asked you to pray for them, you know, remember all the people that have asked you to pray for them, bring them before the Lord. Um, I, I'm a priest, and so I, I pray um, uh, the office, or part of the office, usually during my holy hour. But what you're suggesting, great, bring the Bible. Fulton Jean said, you know, for priests, uh, work on your homilies. Bring your homily notes in, uh, in front of the Blessed Sacrament. John Paul II did. He would always bring a, a writing a pad and a pen because things would occur to him while he was praying. Um, you mentioned the Liturgy of the Hours, so great. Bring the, bring the Word on Fire Liturgy of the Hours in there. But my main point is, is bring whatever you want. Do whatever you want as long as you're spending the uninterrupted time. That's the main thing. You know, just a general remark, I, I would be a little wary of getting it too cluttered up with, okay, I'm going to do all these things. I've got this whole program lined up. Because part of it is just, you know, just breathe and just pray the rosary or something very meditative. Uh, spend some time just in the presence of the Lord. So it's not like a study session. <laughs> I'm going to spend an hour now, you know. Or if you read the Bible, do it like Lexio Divina style, that you're going to read it a very small section, very slowly, you know, meditating, ruminating on each line, that sort of thing. Um, I think it's a time, though, to kind of slow down, let things be a bit, be in the presence of the Lord in a reflective, contemplative manner, I think is a good idea. But basically, take the time and then do whatever is, whatever strikes you as right. Well, thanks for that great question, Elijah. Bishop, as we wrap up the Advent season here, we get close to Christmas. I was wondering if perhaps we could close with a Christmas blessing from you to all of our listeners. Sure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, make us more and more aware of your Son's presence in our lives as we come into this holy season when you sent your Son to be with us and to share your life with us. Lord, make us more and more aware of the presence of Christ among us as he seeks to be born in our hearts. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon all of you and remain with you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. And thanks to all of you for watching and listening. On behalf of Bishop Barron, Word on Fire, all that 
all the people that work and support Word on Fire. I wish all of you a very Merry Christmas, and we'll see you on the next time on the Word on Fire show. <laughs>